Welcome to the I Love Seville show. It's Jerry Miller. Great Monday. Thank you for joining us here on the I Love Seville network. A lot we're going to cover with two, I think, front runners for the Charlottesville City Council race. Lloyd Snook and Michael Payne will join us shortly. We are going to host a live debate here on the I Love Seville show, and I'm going to speak with confidence and conviction. This undoubtedly will be the most watched debate in Charlottesville, Virginia history. Book it. Check the numbers. Um, I'm not just hyping it. It's a reality, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we get to Michael Payne, before we get to Lloyd Snook, let's thank uh, some of the fantastic people that make this program possible. First, the fine folks at Greenberry's Coffee. I have Greenberry's right here. Michael Payne drinking Greenberry's next to me. I think Lloyd Snook, who's been up since, I believe, probably 3.30 in the morning, has enough <laughs> coffee in him already. So he's got some agua in the cup. Uh, guys, did you know for 28 years, a husband and wife started a company out of Charlottesville, Virginia? Virginia. They had a beat-up Honda Civic, and they had in the willingness to work. Their names are Sean and Roxanne Simmons. They said, we're going to start a coffee, a, a gourmet coffee company, a craft coffee company, at a time when all people did from a coffee drinking standpoint was drinking black and white coffee. They opened it in Barracks Road Shopping Center. Their roasting facility was in the McIntyre Office Park. Today, it's a global business with locations in Qatar, Japan, Saudi Arabia, very soon to open in Portland, Washington, D.C., and it all started right here in Charlottesville, Virginia, the kind of stories we love to celebrate at I Love Seville. I also want to give some big time props to Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. Both Greenberry's Coffee and Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. We are their advertising agency of record, and we love to work with them. Scott Wagner, who's got your back? His team most certainly does. I remember when he was one doctor and two people working up front. Now he's five doctors and a team of 18 people. He just purchased the former Quinn Farmer auction house. This man making big-time moves and certainly changing the quality of life of people all over Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Let's give some props to the people that make the show possible, like Harris Tolber, our director, like Judah Wickhauer, our producer, like Lauren Lindsay our producer as well. The feed is freaking hopping right now and just absolutely in fuego. I think Harris Tolbert, let's go to the bird's eye view shot um, and then let's welcome, after the bird's eye view shot, let's welcome um, the gentleman to the show. Um, let's cut straight to it. This is how it's going to work. I have a bell right here and I'm going to notify the gentleman. Um, I'm going to give them 90 seconds for each question. The previous debate they were just at, they had 60 seconds. We have no time limit on this program, so we're going to give them an extra 30 seconds per question. When you guys hear this first bell, that means you have 15 seconds left. When we hear it again, that means you need to stop talking. Um, we're going to go with question. Question one, we'll start with Michael Payne first, and then Lloyd Snook will have a chance to answer. Question two, we'll start with Lloyd Snook first, and then Michael Payne will have a chance to answer. Like I said, I have 13, I have 15 questions ready to go, but I, I am willing to take questions from the live audience. I already have some coming in from LinkedIn, from Twitter, from Instagram, from direct message. I will not take questions about the White House. Um, I will take questions um, if you would like to ask them. They are not on my pad about what's going on at the governor's mansion and the top three positions in the Commonwealth because I think they do have some impact and certainly are correlated in some ways to the Charlottesville City Council. All right, um, Harris Tolbert, let's start first with Michael Payne. I'm going to queue up my stopwatch. Michael Payne is running for Charlottesville City Council. And he is a very talented individual. And here's the first question. And this question kind of uh, takes the uh, Haven debate and brings it to a, a different level. Uh, in the February 23rd edition of the Charlottesville Daily Progress, um, Tyler Hamill um, wrote in his story, um, the candidates often overlapped in what they believed their backgrounds and their solutions could bring to the community. I read that to the lines as, you know, through the lines as you guys said a lot of the same things. I mean, I think that's pretty much what he was saying. So we're going to cut to the chase, and I'm going to ask you this question, Michael Payne. What separates you from Lloyd Snook? You have 90 seconds, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, in my background, um, working as a community organizer, co-founding in Invisible Charlottesville, working with the Charlottesville Low-Income Housing Coalition, together Seville and other groups, in really um, taking a community organizing approach, both to running for office and how I would govern if on city council, um, in terms of policy issues, um, I think you know there may be some differences in terms of willingness uh, to invest in the community if that requires raising revenue, um, prioritizing public housing redevelopment, um, perhaps some differences on zoning reform. Um, so I think those are some big ones um, as well. Um, 
really for myself, really prioritizing climate change locally and figuring out how we can take bold action on the climate crisis. I think that is, has to be one of the top priorities for the city and we have to become a statewide leader on uh, planning sustainably and becoming a model for how communities can start to address the climate crisis at a municipal level. Okay, we have, we're gonna reset the clock here. Lloyd Snoke, you have 90 seconds. What separates you um, from Michael Payne? Go, sir. Well, I think the, the first thing that will be obvious just about everybody is I'm older. <laughs> now that's both a good thing and a bad thing. And I've been getting a lot of sort of this, hey, here's the old white guy kind of stuff on Twitter and so on. The point that I, I guess I would make is that my experience with all of these issues that we're talking about, I think, is, is important. I've said there are basically three issues I want to be talking about. The first is that our government is not working well, and that just doesn't, that doesn't mean only Monday night chaos. It means the chaos behind the scenes. It means that the city manager has not managed the city well in a long time. There are problems there. I've got some experience with that. I've seen how cities work when they work well. Second, affordable housing. I was you know, involved with affordable housing as early as, uh, actually my family was before me, but 1980 I was on the board of the Community Energy Conservation Program, the, weather, well, the weatherization program and PHA and so on. I incorporated the first Greater Charlottesville Habitat for Humanity 30 plus years ago. The third issue that I want to talk a lot about is cr uh, some criminal justice aspects, what I've called the pipeline to prison. 39 years of criminal defense lawyer. I have seen racial discrimination in policing. I have seen racial discrimination in the criminal justice system, and I have some ideas as to how we might be able to get that done. Differences, I don't know there are a lot of differences. I haven't heard them articulated yet, but hopefully we'll articulate them today. All right, well done, right on 90 seconds. Thank you, gentlemen. The first question in the books. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, <clears throat> put them in whatever channel you're watching on. This live debate streamed across seven channels on the I Love Seville network, including his um, city council professional page, his politician page, and his personal Facebook page. Question two, we start with him, and then you have a chance to rebuttal. You have 90 seconds on this topic, Lloyd Snook. Um, there has been tremendous attrition in the Charlottesville Police Department. How do we solve the attrition in the CPD? We're talking specifics and not more macro, but micro specifics of how to solve the attrition in the Charlottesville Police Department. 90 seconds starts now, Lloyd. There are three things that were being complained about when this story came out at the beginning of January. The first thing, low pay. We're paying a starting salary $5,000 less than even the University of Virginia Police Department, less than the Albemarle County Police Department. Uh, there was a general thought of, gee, we should raise the pay effective the new fiscal year. You could raise it right now if you wanted to. There's enough money in the budget because all, all of the people who aren't there, if, they, if council wanted to, that's, that's low-hanging fruit. You could get that. Second thing is uh, the question of uh, take-home vehicles, because that has turned out to be sort of a perk of the, of the office, of the job that some members of the, of the police department have come to rely on. That's also something that can be fixed. Just have to think about it. The third thing is the question of that the police officers don't feel that there's anybody in city council or the top city leadership that has their back against what they see in the civilian review board as degenerating into a potential personnel review board for the police department. They're very worried about that. Again, there's some things we can talk about there, uh, and I've got some fairly specific things of what I think the civilian review board could spend its time on that would get it to where they want it. They can take action right now if they want to, if they get away from some of the things they've been talking about. Okay, that's under 90 seconds. Thank you, Lloyd Snook. Michael Payne, tremendous attrition in the Charlottesville Police Department. If you are elected to the Charlottesville City Council, what do you do to solve this attrition? What should be done to keep our police officers, the people that protect our community from leaving to other forces? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing that we should note is that Charlottesville is not unique in this problem of attrition. UVA and other communities throughout Virginia are experiencing similar problems. So it's not something that is unique to Charlottesville. Um, I think, I would reframe it a little bit. I think a lot of it comes down to, from both a history of discriminatory policing practices in the summer of 2017, a breakdown of trust between the local community and the police department. And I think that has created a lot of problems and I think probably is a part of the attrition issue. And so I think the way we, 
address it is by rebuilding trust between the community and the police department. I think we do that by encouraging accountability and transparency in, in terms of data about stop and frisk, um, stop and frisk policies, um, as well as having a robust civilian police review board that the community has trust and faith in. I think this also intersects a lot with the affordable housing issue. A lot of police officers, as well as nurses, firefighters, and even city staff are not able to live in the city of Charlottesville because housing is so expensive. And I think that creates a huge problem when people who are policing the local community aren't able to even able to live there. And I think that also intersects with some of the issues in terms of pay, in terms of just how high the cost of living is in Charlottesville. Um, good answer from both um, candidates right there. I appreciate that. We have one that's come in from the chat box. It is not on my list of questions. Barbara Lundgren um, has brought a good one to the table. If you have a question for either council candidate, I'm happy to relay it to them. Put it in any chat box that you're watching across the I Love Seville network. You went first on question two, so you go first on question three. Michael Payne, the Landmark Hotel, this is from Barbara Lundgren. The Landmark Hotel is an utter eyesore in the downtown mall. What can be done to solve this hideous eyesore that is negatively impacting the city of Charlottesville? Michael Payne, you are on the clock. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the problem is the city has not had a unified negotiating strategy on how to deal with this issue. At one time, the city was exploring um, taking an aggressive approach in terms of threatening to declare the property as blight. Then the city abruptly changed course and decided to strike a deal with him, and then the city um, ended up rejecting that deal, and now we're sort of in limbo. But I think the first thing we have to recognize is that we're dealing with essentially a multi-millionaire slumlord. This is someone who, according to Bloomberg, is known as the emperor of empty lots. He owns properties across the United States where he does this. He buys properties in downtown areas and refuses to develop them until local governments give him uh, taxpayers' money. And he's also been sued by a lot of neighborhoods and the few projects he has completed because he didn't follow what he said he was going to do. I think um, Charleston, South Carolina, the Board of Architectural Review sued him as well as neighbors. And so I think um, when dealing with people like that, we have to take an aggressive approach. And I would agree with what Planning Commissioner Rory Stolzenberg said on this program, that we should name and shame. We should be taking photos, trying to hold them accountable, and taking an aggressive approach as possible before deciding to strike any kind of deal with them. Because I think it sets a dangerous precedent when we're giving taxpayer money to a private developer because they feel they can hold the city hostage. That dynamic happens in cities across the United States. It happens all the time in Baltimore. It reduces their tax pace results in a lot of corruption, and I think it's a really bad precedent for how development should work in the city. Michael Payne has had a chance for 90 seconds. You have 90 seconds of rebuttal. Lloyd Snook, your thoughts on the Landmark Hotel and what can be done to this eyesore on uh, the city's uh, downtown mall? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I, let me sound a theme that you will hear a lot when you talk about what local government can do, and that is we can't do a lot. Uh, under the Dillon rule that applies in Virginia, state uh, uh, local governments are very limited in what they can do. And so a lot of the proposals to, you know, to tear it down, to eminent domain, whatever, run afoul of that. So the dramatic steps that we can take just aren't there. The few things we can do, and Michael mentioned we should have an, a, a unified negotiating strategy. We actually did, except you know, they thought they had three votes for it, and then when it came to an actual vote, they didn't have three votes for it. That's part of the confusion and the disorder at the top of the ticket that I think is a problem. Uh, as far as what we can do, I mean, Rory's, uh, one of Rory's suggestions was simply, okay, they're paying $65,000 a year in taxes. Eventually, they're going to get tired of that to, for this shell. That doesn't help us locally. I have to say that uh, the, the name and shame, I, mean, I, I talked to somebody else who said, well, we, we ought to just decide we're going to take on uh, Mr. Dewberry full front and just, you know, have, have folks go picket places where he's got projects. and. I don't know that we can do all of that, but I do think that we need to have uh, a, a I, I think we would have been better served uh, probably to have gone ahead with the deal that failed, that did not get three votes. Where we go from now, I don't really know, frankly. Um, the extorting emperor of empty lots is what we have dubbed him here on the I Love Seville show. Clearly part of um, uh, Johnny Dewberry's strategy is to extort municipalities until they give him enough tax breaks where he finally goes into action. 
Um, I hate people who do business that way, and unfortunately, it's impacting the downtown mall. Um, question three. You started question, the last question. Question three starts with you, um, Lloyd Snook. What do you think of our current Seville City Council? How would you grade their performance post A12? Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds. Uh, C, C minus. I, I'm not pleased with the way that they have been so dysfunctional themselves. Uh, there are a lot of votes that I think are being taken where uh, some counselors have taken position, have decided on what their positions are without having talked with others. There doesn't seem to be a lot of effort to negotiate one with another, to discuss one with another. I've talked to at least a couple of counselors who have said that they don't usually end up talking with the other counselors before they get up in front of the meeting. That's not a good way to govern. And I know people don't want to talk about backroom dealing and so on, but ultimately the only way you get decisions made in a state like Virginia that has very strict open meeting rules is that you have one counselor call up another counselor and say, what do you think? I used to do that all the time on the Planning Commission when I was on the Planning Commission in the 1980s. Call up any other planning commissioners and say, hey, what do you think about this? Can we, can we come to some agreement? Can we make some changes on things that we ought to get fixed? That's the way to do that. And I think we would be able to get some better decisions out of council and they would be able to articulate things with one voice rather than a sort of a smattering of dissents. Um, Michael Payne, you have 90 seconds to answer this question. What do you think of our current Charlottesville City Council? How would you grade their performance post-August 12th? Michael Payne, you're on the clock. Similarly, I would give it C, C minus, but I would reframe it slightly in that I think a lot of the problem is that there's been a breakdown of trust between the local community and city government, not only because of the summer of 2017, but a long history of uh, development decisions in this city, top-down approaches, and I think that is preventing city government from operating to full effectiveness. And I view our challenge as how do we rebuild trust between the local community and local government? And I think we do that by taking a community organizing approach, going out into the community and working across differences, uplifting work that's already being done as well as to acknowledge that there are legitimate reasons that people have lost faith in local government and that as local elected officials, we are not owed respect or trust. We have to earn it. And I think, again, doing that requires a community organizing approach. And I think once we start to rebuild that trust, we're going to see city government be able to unify around policies that uh, improve life for the citizens of this city and make a positive impact. I think. If we don't do that and if we engage in a top-down approach, I don't think we're going to get to a point where city government can function effectively. Michael Payne, well done here. Um, so you have the next question to start. This one's going to come from former mayor Dave Norris. I'm literally doing five things at once while hosting this program. Michael Payne, you're going to start. Um, Dave Norris, this is a longer question. Prepare yourselves with this one. Um, thank you, Dave Norris, for asking this question. The city, either on its own or in conjunction with regional partners, has issued or plans to issue tens of millions of dollars in bonds for various projects. For example, new water pipeline, new parking garage, West Main streetscape improvements, et cetera. Both city council candidates, here's the question. Would you support a similar bond measure for affordable housing? Why or why not? Michael Payne, 90 seconds, you're on the clock. I absolutely would, 100%, and I think it would also have to be a top priority within our capital improvement projects budget. Particularly when it comes to public housing, I think we need to do it because at a national level, the Trump administration has been cutting money to HUD. We know that um, at the national and state level, they've decided to not invest in public housing. So as a local community, we have to pick up that burden, and I think it's a moral obligation for us as a city, given the history of how we have continued to get kick the can down the road on redevelopment of public housing. And we see folks living in Crescent Halls, living in unacceptable, unacceptable conditions in terms of sewage regularly backing up, heat going out in the winter, and people having to use their ovens for heat. We can't continue to let that happen. It's unacceptable for us as a city, and I think it's perfectly feasible for us to make that investment in our capital improvement project budget. And we should also be looking at um, a bond for affordable housing that also is going into Habitat, our community land trust, redevelopment of Friendship Court. So we're providing a laddership of housing opportunities for people in public housing, Section 8 rentals, 
people who can become homeowners and build wealth and generational equity. And I think if we don't make that investment in our capital improvement projects budget, it's not going to happen and it's going to make our affordable housing crisis even worse and accelerate inequality locally. And I just don't think that's acceptable. Okay. Thank you, Michael Payne. Lloyd Snook, the question, would you support a similar bond measure for affordable housing? Why or why not? The question from former Mayor Dave Norris. Well, two things. First of all, let me just say, to be picky, not everything that we would want to do for affordable housing is bondable. There are some expenditures for capital improvements that we, we can't issue bonds for. But there are some things we can. For example, I think we can do bonds on the improvements to Crescent Halls, for example, and, and, uh, and in West Haven, if those are to be re redeveloped. The, <clears throat> there was an interesting thing that happened on December 6th. There was a meeting to discuss the capital improvement budget. And the, the, the notion had been floated that we should expect to spend $50 million. We should have a $50 million bond issue deal with affordable housing. And it, for the first time at that meeting, somebody from the finance staff said, you know what $50 million in bonds really means? It means we basically lose our AAA bond rating. It means we go over the internal guidelines we had set for how much bond and bond ser debt service we want to have. And the people on the council went, whoa, really? Nobody had actually thought about that. Maybe we need to think about that from an earlier point. In general, yes, I'm okay with, with using bonds for West Haven, for using bonds for Crescent Hall, recognizing that the, the city school system wants $50 million in bonds as well. It's gonna be a tough, tough way to figure this thing out. I'm not morally opposed to it. I hope we can work it out. I don't know how we're gonna work it out, but we need to. Good question, good answer. Appreciate your uh, perspective from both of you guys. A lot of questions now coming into the feed. Like and share the stream. Put the public spotlight on both city councilors. I think a lot of folks see these two gentlemen as front runners for two of the three seats that are, um, that are up for grabs in the June 11th primary. You went first on the last question, so it's your turn to go first on this question. Um, literally doing seven things at once here. I did not think this would go as smooth as it has, and I'm honestly pleasantly surprised so far. Uh, Charlottesville City Council is considering raising real estate taxes. I have a thorough analysis on ilovesevo.com about this. From my standpoint, there is a direct contradiction with affordable housing and the increase of real estate taxes in the city of Charlottesville. However, my opinion means nothing. Your opinions are the ones that matter. Should real estate taxes be raised in the city of Seville? If so, if real estate taxes are increased in the city of Seville, how will this impact the upper class, the middle class, and our citizens that are making below AMI area median income? Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds. Well, first of all, think about the fact that one penny on the, on the tax rate means about $757,000. That's a lot of money, but it's not a whole lot of money. And the, we're talking about a $6 million shortfall at this point. Nobody is talking about raising taxes <clears throat> excuse me, by an amount that would be necessary to solve that problem. They're talking about maybe one or two cents. That would be perhaps $1.5 million. We need to figure out other ways to be smarter with our money. I, the, the first thing I will say is sort of a cop-out, which is that we won't have to decide. Neither Michael nor I will have a vote on this budget. Uh, that budget will be set uh, starting in, actually starting next week, uh, but it'll be done long before we take office. Uh, but the, the longer range issue, it seems to me, is I think that the city has been very difficult for developers to work in so that they can't do the projects that are going to increase our tax base. For example, the, the proposal that ultimately just died this past year uh, for the um, uh, Keith Woodard's proposal on Water Street would have brought in the equivalent of one cent on the tax rate. It would have been brought in about $757,000 or so in taxes in one year. We have to recognize that that's the way we solve this problem, not by raising taxes. $80 million Keith Woodard project. Um, we have NBC 29 outside filming B-roll. Um, every single media outlet in Charlottesville, Virginia is currently on the stream right now getting quotes for their stories. Um, they're more than willing to use this platform to quote their stories. Michael Payne, the same question to you, sir. If real estate taxes are raised in the city of Charlottesville, how will this impact our wealthiest citizens, our middle class citizens, and our citizens that are earning below AMI? Michael Payne, 90 seconds. 
Well, first, I'd just say real quick, I think Woodard's property failed because market conditions changed. I don't think that was a failure of city government not supporting it enough. But I'd say, look, I make a little bit more than minimum wage. 40 to 50% of my income goes to rent. If it were not for Medicaid expansion, I would not have access to health insurance. To me, this is not a theoretical debate. I budget dollar to dollar each month, and any increases in taxes affect that budgeting. But I would say this as well. If city council has kicked the can down the road on significant investments for years, on affordable housing, on public housing, and on infrastructure. And at some point, we have to stop and say, we have to make these investments. And now that, that is coming due. Development and revenue from development is certainly part of the picture. And ideally, we don't have to raise taxes. But if city staff, if we've cut waste and reprioritized and city staff comes back and says, look, there's still not enough. I think it's worth making that investment. I think it's worth increasing revenue to be able to invest in public housing redevelopment, invest in our infrastructure, invest in uh, affordable housing strategy. And as a city, we're in a difficult situation. The draft fiscal year 20 budget had a $6 million budget shortfall. We're spending $10 million a year on debt payments, and that was before $16 million was added this year. And by the way, that's without any of the school's $50 million request. So if we're talking about revenue, we have to be honest. If we don't raise it, that means no school modernization and expansion. That means we might not be able to invest in public housing. And that means we might have to cut capital improvement projects for infrastructure like West Main Street redevelopment or re redeveloping the Belmont Bridge. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, NBC 29's Henry Graff. You're looking sharp, Henry Graff. Nice to see you, sir. Um, next question is a piggyback of the previous question. Um, this is on the meals tax. There are a lot of restaurateurs in the city of Charlottesville that are utterly petrified that the meals tax is being considered, you know, raise, raising the meals tax after it was done just a short while ago. Here's the question. Restaurateurs are opposed to raising the meals tax, Lloyd. Should the meals tax be increased, how will this impact restaurateurs? How will this impact their employees? How will this impact the guests, especially the guests who are already on the cusp of being able to afford going out to some of the expensive restaurants in Charlottesville, and let's be honest, there are many expensive restaurants in Charlottesville. Lloyd Stoke, 90 seconds, you're on the clock. Actually, I think he's on the clock. Oh, you're right, I apologize, I'm gonna reset. Thank you very much, Lloyd. So you were <clears throat> on the clock, Michael Payne. Thank you for the correction, sir. You were on the clock, Michael Payne, 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. Again, I believe in just being honest, even if it's not politically convenient. <clears throat> the meals tax <clears throat> is a regressive tax, but we're in a difficult situation because the Dillon rule prevents Charlottesville from using any methods of raising revenue besides real estate tax, meals tax, lodging tax, and a few others which don't raise significant revenue for the city. It is regressive. Ideally, we don't have to, but we're in a very difficult budget situation. And the flip side of it is we talk about the impact of raising taxes, but the impact of not raising it means, again, no school modernization and expansion, not being able to afford redevelopment of public housing, not being able to afford investing in a public housing or a affordable housing strategy, or not being able to do necessary infrastructure projects like West Main, Belmont Bridge. And I think we cannot give in to the austerity politics being pushed by Trump and Republicans in Congress that says it's not worth investing in our communities. The long-term impact of those investments, I think, outweighs the cost of raising it. And again, our meals tax is 5%. For, for comparison, Roanoke's is 5.5%. In Richmond, Mayor LeVar Stoney recently proposed increasing theirs to 7.5%. If we want to be a 21st century city, we can't do that with a revenue arrangement of a 20th century town. Well done. Okay, same question to you, meals tax. How will the meals tax, if it's raised, impact the restaurateurs? How will the meals tax impact their employees? the diners that go to restaurants, um, and some who are already on the cusp of not being able to afford going out to eat in Charlottesville, Virginia. Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds now, my friend. You are on the clock. <laughs> okay, first of all, one cent on the meals tax works out to about $2.4 million. That is the single biggest ticket item that we've got in terms of ways to raise money in a hurry. Uh, that. Raising taxes, raising a meals tax one cent, uh, one percent is, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's easier than some other choices. How it will affect the restaurateurs, obviously they're not going to like it, and the people who eat out aren't going to like it. Uh, but I, I, there's one thing I want to point out, and that is when Michael talks about rejecting Republican austerity politics, the, the Republican scheme nationally has been to cut taxes on the rich 
we don't have that ability here. We're talking about progressive, about regressive taxation, a totally different issue. The issue for us, it seems to me, I understand that we need to spend money, and I'm all in favor of doing the things we need to do, and many of the things Michael has talked about we need to do. Uh, but it's not fair to call, to analogize here to Republican austerity politics. Okay. Um, I get a lot of response to the meals tax, and we'll have you make sure you're talking to that mic for us. Same there with Michael Payne. A lot of feedback um, on this one. One of the restaurateurs who asked not to be named on the debate says, the meals tax was sold to us as something that would be paid for by tourists. If the businesses and us restaurateurs are saying don't raise the tax, then don't raise the tax. I did not name your name, but I appreciate your comment. Another comment on the meals, the meals tax is a hot button. Um, Bill Farley, he doesn't mind if his name is used. Bill Farley says, meals tax isn't a tax on the business, it's a tax on the customers. It's a horrible revenue idea. If you have any comments you'd like to share, put it in the chat box. I will relay it to the council candidates, and I will also ask questions. Um, this question has come in from Jojo Robertson, and it's a longer question. Um, you just went last, so you go first this time. This is a very interesting question. Um, in 2016, I challenged Charlottesville, this is Jojo Robertson. In 2016, I challenged Charlottesville City Council to spend one week at Crescent Halls. Crescent Halls has been filled with bed bugs, with feces that comes up from the drains, oppressive heat and cockroaches and more. The Crescent Halls residents came to the meeting and stood up to say they would allow a member of council to spend one week in their unit. However, not one member said they would do this. I am asking both Lloyd Snook and Michael Payne, would you spend one week in the residence apartments at Crescent Halls so you can understand the plight of our public housing citizens, our citizens that need your voice because they're often the ones unheard? Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds. As I recall, at least one of the proposals, and maybe came from Mary Carey instead of Jojo Robertson, was spend one night. I mean, I there are two issues here. Issue number one, yet do I need to understand what's going on at Crescent Halls? Absolutely. And I've visited clients in Crescent Halls, <clears throat> and I know their, their conditions are not good. Uh, one week is a huge disruption. One night, not a problem. I, I mean, let's talk about what the parameters are. I don't, I don't know there's anything magic about it being one week. But I do want to understand exactly what they're dealing with. I've, I've been in situations where there have been bed bugs and feces. I, that's not news to me, but I'm perfectly willing to, to experience it as they experience it. Michael Payne, 90 seconds, I'm resetting. You are on the clock. Mm -hmm. I absolutely would. And again, I think this ties into the revenue conversation. The taxes we are able to use as a city are regressive. I don't want to have to raise them. I realize that there's trade-offs. In an ideal world, we don't have to. But if we make all our cuts and reprioritize and city staff comes back to us and says we aren't able to make the investments we need without increasing revenue, the cost is we have to go to our citizens living in Crescent Halls and West Haven and tell them, sorry, for another decade, we're going to put off redevelopment of public housing. We're going to kick the can, kick the can down the road again. That is morally unacceptable. The, trade-off of being able to make that investment is worth it. Okay, gentlemen, I can see both council candidates are building momentum as the debate has getting uh, more mature. I like the uh, energy I'm feeling right here on set. Over 500 people currently watching the live stream right now. A couple of uh, follow-ups to the meals tax. This one from Jehu Martin, a a um, you know an evangelist of Charlottesville he says we do not need to raise meals taxes it is too high as it is stop the millions of foolish projects approve that which will generate revenue like affordable housing for middle classes so much can also be done with intelligent city planning and intelligent spending you went last on the past question so you go first on this one new question for Michael Payne 44 percent of African Americans in a recent survey felt disenchanted and unwelcomed on the downtown mall how do we make the downtown mall more approachable, not only for African Americans, but for citizens in totality? We often hear about homelessness and how panhandlers are aggressive when people are walking up and down the mall, which makes them feel uncomfortable downtown. Restaurateurs are unwilling to say this because of fear of ramifications from a PR standpoint. I don't have those fears. Um, what are specific changes you would implement to make the downtown mall more approachable, more welcoming, not only to the 44% of African Americans who felt uncomfortable, but to citizens in totality in Charlottesville and Central Virginia? Michael Payne, 90 seconds, you're on the clock. Mm -hmm. 
Well, first, real quickly, I just want to say I do not think homeless on the downtown mall are part of that problem. Our homeless residents are part of this community. They're valuable, and they should be supported. And in fact, I think we need more benches on the downtown mall so life is easier for our homeless residents. But I would also say this. I think the downtown mall is not accessible because it's not affordable and it's becoming less and less affordable. Like just recently, the CVS closed indefinitely, one of the few affordable places on the mall. I think the destruction of the Main Street Arena is having a huge negative impact. You had S Cafe, which was a community space for Charlottesville's LGBTIQ community. You had the Annie Room, which was a space for rap concerts as well as metal concerts. And you had the Ice Rink, which was a place for families that was affordable as a community space on the weekend. All that's gone and being replaced by corporate office spaces. It's part of the mall becoming less and less affordable. And if people go to the downtown mall and they can't find a meal or uh, a, a business that's affordable to them, they're not going to go. I think another part of it is we need to have more minority-owned businesses, not just on the mall, but throughout our community. And local government needs to be working to support minority-owned businesses. I think that's another part of the problem. I think the core of it, again, is becoming more and more unaffordable in the destruction of cultural spaces that were accessible to working families. Michael Payne, 90 seconds is over. Thank you for that perspective. Lloyd Snook, the same question to you. 44% of African Americans felt disenchanted and unwelcome on the downtown mall in a recent survey. How do we make the mall more approachable, not only for African Americans, but citizens in totality? What needs to be done? Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds, sir, you're on the clock. Recognize, first of all, that most of the decisions that are, are affecting that sense of welcome are not government decisions. They are private property owner decisions over which city council has no control. I was talking with Eugene Williams recently, and he said, you know, he, he didn't come to my event to kick off my campaign at Bashir's basically because he doesn't come to the downtown mall because the people, <clears throat> the businesses there typically haven't hired black people. They, it is not a place that he and others feel comfortable and welcome because the private enterprises there haven't hired folks who are like him. And he's been a civil rights icon in this community for, for generations. Uh, and that's a big part of it. Uh, note that there is absolutely nothing that the city, as far as I'm aware, the, that the city could have done uh, to preserve Escafe or to preserve the ante room. That was a personal private property decision and we have no ability to affect that. What we can do, one thing we can do is I think we need to get back uh, to having a, and this may make some people unhappy, but to say, you know, community policing and a better police presence on the mall. There have been times recently where it might be 10 minutes would go by before a police officer would come. There was an attack recently of some white supremacist guy who was mentally ill was attacking a black person, and it took 10 minutes for a police officer to get there. That's something we can do, and it, it gets back to the question of can we staff our police department adequately. Uh, a couple points I will add to that. Joffrey Woodruff did purchase the Ice Park, which included, uh, also purchased the Escafe restaurant and the anti-room. Um, Joffrey Woodruff of the QIM Hedge Fund, which is across the street from here, the Macklin Building, he is building a tech epicenter to house many investments in his portfolio. Uh, um, also, on the downtown mall, I, I do not understand why the police presence is not greater on the downtown mall. At least a bike officer going up and down the mall. Perception is reality, often from a law enforcement standpoint. A couple of folks have chimed in on this. Um, Jehu Martin says, relocate the Haven. It was a bad decision to put it downtown. The restaurateur, who has to be named, said, yeah, that's definitely the nucleus of the problem down here. Benjamin Doe said, if the residents of Crescent Hall want their representatives to spend a week there to understand what's wrong with our public housing. We need city councilors who will do that. Glad to see Michael and Lloyd commit to doing that without hesitation. You have said you're willing to spend a week there. Um, he, Lloyd Snook has said he will spend a night there. Jojo Robertson adds, thank you to both Lloyd Snook and Michael Payne for saying that they would spend a night in Crescent Halls. Um, and she also adds, yes, we need more benches downtown. If you have a question, comment, or concern, put it in the chat box. I'm happy to relay it to the council candidates. The live stream is on fire right now. Um, we will go to another question. He just answered last, which means he goes first this time. Adam Healy and the CACVB, um, they are in charge of the regional and national advertising campaign that is supposedly um, supposed to change the conversation, the image, the stigma of Charlottesville, Virginia. Two-part question. Lloyd Snook, what did you think of this campaign? 
Uh, and the second part of the question is, should politicians be on the CACVB and be making the decisions about advertising campaigns instead of the interim director himself, Adam Healy, who shockingly to me has no vote in this. Lloyd Snook, I'm gonna call up my stopwatch. You are on the clock, go. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think there was a new, a new campaign that was un unveiled just this past week, which I like better for a couple of reasons. Just One, got approved. Yeah, one, I mean, I never understood even what the first campaign was trying to say. It just didn't make sense. Second, the first campaign seemed to be very consciously pitched towards white yuppies. And at least a couple of pictures that I saw, there was some diversity in the pictures represented. I like the message a little bit better. I hope that that, that, that will work. Uh, I think clearly Charlottesville and Charlottesville and Albemarle, taken as a whole, have a lot of attractiveness. We have, to, we have to understand that what we're trying to do is attract tourists. We're not trying to make residents feel good, necessarily. We don't want there to be a disconnect, but the purpose is to attract tourists, and I think that this might well uh, attract some tourists. As far as whether politicians should be on the board, I'm certainly uh, a fan of ex officio members and so on. I'm not sure that I'm a fan of having the city councilors themselves be on the board. Um, as far as why Adam Healy doesn't have a vote, heck if I know, that's a bylaws issue that somebody ought to take a look at. Uh, Michael Payne, you have 90 seconds to rebuttal. Adam Healy and the CACVB um, are integrating a regional and national campaign that just got approved. What do you think of the approved campaign? You can also add your perspective on the first round of the campaign. How would you change it? What do you like about it? Also, should politicians and uh, should politicians be making uh, be voting in favor of advertising campaigns as opposed to the interim director who is a non-voting member? Michael Payne, 90 seconds. You're on the clock, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so far from what I've seen, I don't think the campaign has been very effective. I think, in fact, it's backfired a little bit. Um, I think there's a more fundamental issue, I think, in terms of Charlottesville's branding and messaging, and that is, in 2017, we were the site of the largest gathering of far-right white supremacist extremist terrorists in the modern history of this country. For people who know nothing of Charlottesville, that's their association when they hear the word Charlottesville. I think that's the fundamental problem. And I think changing that narrative for people who aren't familiar with Charlottesville beyond that event means committing ourselves to a vision of progressive change and becoming a model for how communities can unify around issues of affordable housing, policing, and economic and racial inequality. And I think if we can start to do that, that's really gonna change the fundamental narrative. Um, advertising campaigns you know, might have some small effect, but I think right now the advertising campaigns aren't um, diverse enough in terms of class or race representation, which I think is gonna create some problems in terms of how effective it's gonna be. As for politicians voting on it, I mean, I think city council members are stakeholders. I think you know, it makes sense for them to be in the room and perhaps vote, but they also shouldn't be driving the whole process. They're stakeholders, but they're not the end all be all. This is um, a follow up to this question. Maggie Thornton, I will get to your question. There are a number of questions coming in right now to the chat box. I have a number of questions left. This is clearly on fire right now. Albemarle County, you just went last, so you go first on the next question. Ann Malik, Board of Supervisors, is adamant that Albemarle County be included into the national and regional campaign. Um, a lot of folks disagree with this. Some folks say outside of Albemarle County in Central Virginia, you cannot pronounce the word Albemarle. A lot of folks say that the word Albemarle is tied to North Carolina. Folks that visit Charlottesville in Central Virginia, some folks that are on 151 or enjoying a, a glass of beer or a wine and, and crozet still think that they're in the city of Charlottesville. A lot of confusion where the city county line is. I'm gonna leave my personal perspectives out of this. Here is the question, Albemarle County, should Albemarle County be included in the regional and national campaign? Taxpayer money is going to fund this campaign. Michael Payne, 90 seconds, you're on the clock. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Albemarle is already included in the sense that I think the wineries uh, pictured in their advertising are in Albemarle. But, um, I mean, I view Albemarle and Charlottesville as one community. Um, I grew up in Albemarle, went to high school at Albemarle High School. Um, I really think people consider it one community, and I think um, Albemarle certainly um, should be stakeholders in this process. In terms of what that looks like, I mean, I think for, you know, when when growing up in Albemarle, I would refer to my city as Charlottesville. I think most people who think of the 
this region, if they're not familiar with it, they think of Charlottesville. So I think in terms of effectiveness of ad campaigns, you know, I would imagine that Charlottesville would be center to that, just in terms of effectiveness. But I certainly think our model should be stakeholders. Uh, Michael Payne, thank you for your perspective. Lloyd Snook and Malik, Board of Supervisors, adamant that Albemarle County be included in the regional and national campaign. I think it's a $350,000 taxpayer funded campaign now that's recently approved. On that note, I'm going to welcome Adam Healy on the show tomorrow to talk about this campaign, along with Peter Castiglione, the owner of Maya Restaurant. He is a big time, uh, you know, one of the board of directors in the Virginia Tours, Tourism Lodging Restaurant Association. Both those gentlemen will join us tomorrow. So make sure you tune in at 12.30. Yes, that's a teaser in my business. Lloyd Snook, I'm going to put you on the clock for 90 seconds. Albemarle County, should the two words Albemarle County be included in the regional and national campaign? 90 seconds, sir. That is the kind of decision that city council shouldn't be making. Period. That's an expert marketing kind of thing for which I have no competence. I'm not going to claim that I do, but I will note this. If you ask people around the country, where are you from, and you say you're from Albemarle County, nobody has any idea where that is. Nobody flies into the Albemarle County Airport from outside. They fly into the Charlottesville Albemarle Airport, the CHO, not ALB. So Albemarle is inextricably linked to our branding. Whether we put the word Albemarle in the the caption of the picture, or whether we put the word Albemarle in the title, is something for the marketing pros to deal with, but I don't see it as something that we as counselors ought to be getting involved with. Um, next question is going to start with Lloyd Snook. A number of questions coming in. This one's coming in from Lloyd Snook's pay, uh, Facebook page. <laughs> Nina Gregory. Um, Nina Gregory offering perspective. She wants to talk about public transportation. Um, I'm going to take it a step further because I recently did a very thorough analysis on the impact of public transportation in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Frankly, the lack of robust public transportation, accessible and reliable um, public transportation, and how it's negatively impacting the Charlottesville um, city affordable housing crisis. I encourage you to find that, um, that brief on ilovesevil.com. I'm going to throw this to you. You have 90 seconds. Public transportation <clears throat> in Charlottesville and Albemarle County. Nita Gregory, thank you for asking this. Um, how is public transportation in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, and Central Virginia impacting affordable housing? Lloyd Stoke, 90 seconds. The first thing that is obvious is that there are a lot of folks who work at the University of Virginia who can't afford or can't, you know, there really, really isn't even space for them to live around the University of Virginia. And there's not parking around the University of Virginia enough. So a lot of people are going to rely on buses to get to get to their work. Uh, the better that bus system is, the, the more distributed we can have the people. We don't have to have them all living within walking distance of the hospital. Forty years ago, all of the orderlies and the nurses and so on who, who worked at the hospital could walk to work. That can't happen anymore because of gentrification. So absolutely, if we have more public transportation, that helps diffuse some of the problem with, uh, with uh, affordable housing. The other thing I would note is that the, uh, a couple months ago, the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission had a, uh, an event where you could go and you could put little stickers on, on the projects that were of greatest interest to you and thing, places you thought that, mo that money should be spent. And a number of the projects were specifically designed, for example, to have better bus service out to Centera Martha Jefferson Hospital. Great idea. Uh, there, I can't remember. The other one, I think, was uh, more bus service down to, um, to Southwood, I'm, I, if I remember correctly. Those are things that are relatively small dollar things that we can do uh, compared to the multi, multi million dollar construction projects. Uh, Michael Payne, same question. Affordable housing, excuse me, robust public transportation or the lack thereof? No one's throwing anyone under the bus. We're just speaking frankly about what's happening, the infrastructure in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. It is safe to say that the public transportation in Charlottesville, Elmore County, and Central Virginia leaves a lot to be desired from more routes, from more buses, from buses being on time to get folks to and from their gigs, their jobs, whatever it may be. How is public transportation impacting affordable housing in the city of Charlottesville, Elmore County, and Central Virginia? Michael Payne, 90 seconds. I think it has a huge impact. I mean, anyone who has used public transit in Charlottesville and had to rely on it to get to and from work 
can tell you, it doesn't work very well, particularly for working families and particularly for people who work hourly jobs with irregular schedules. And I think that has a huge impact both on our ability to be a sustainable community and on affordable housing because a lot of the changes that would help us build affordable housing in terms of eliminating off-street parking requirements for new developments, um, reducing single-family zoning and allowing more density in duplexes, it's really hard to do those things if you don't have robust public transit and a comprehensive network of pedestrian and bike trails. We have neither right now. I've read research that in order for public transit to be effective, it needs to have regular stops with stops every 10 to 15 minutes. Because until you reach that point, people just don't find it effective enough to use it. But once you do that, then you get an increase in ridership, which creates a positive cycle that can really allow it to take off. I think as an aspirational goal, as we become a regional metropolitan area, our aspirational goal has to be create be to create a regional transit authority. The General Assembly has authorized us to do that, but they didn't authorize any funding mechanism. Right now, the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission recently started a regional transit partnership, which includes Jaunt, CAT, Albemarle, and UVA. I think we need to support that and view that as a stepping stone to regional transit authority. But we also need to take a community organizing approach where as citizens, we need to be going to meetings like the one Lloyd mentioned. We need to be showing up to the regional uh, transit partnership meetings and letting them know we view public transit as one of the top priorities of the city and you need to make it something you focus on. A lot of comments coming in, guys. A lot of comments. The stream is in fuego right now. Um, the one comment, the, the police spend over 90% of their time downtown dealing with the homelessness. If we move the homeless shelters away from downtown, <clears throat> the police have more time to do other things like actually policing. Um, thank you for leaving that comment. Uh, Michael Guthrie says, the Charlottesville Central, Charlottesville Central Virginia would be a better name for the airport than Charlottesville, Albemarle County. Um, Barbara Lundgren says, it is the CACVB with Albemarle in the name, basically alluding to the fact that Albemarle County should be included in the mix. Um, uh, the, there's so much going on right here. Scott, uh, Scott Enworth from, he's watching in Virginia Beach, but he's a diehard Charlottesville guy. Believe he went to UVA. He asked this question, it's a good one, and I'm gonna throw this, you went last, so you go first this time. The Charlottesville city market is now, essentially has no future, at least we don't know what's gonna happen. The Charlottesville city market was gonna be housed in Keith Woodard's $80 million Water Street development. It was gonna be the flagship of the $80 million Water Street development. Now the Charlottesville city market is on a very tight asphalt parking lot that is claustrophobic, that radiates heat, um, that essentially is people elbow to elbow at all times on the city market. The question from Scott in Virginia Beach, where should the city market be located? Michael Payne, 90 seconds, go. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, again, I think we need some clarity on the Woodard project there. Um, market conditions changed from when he started it. It became significantly more expensive because the city was requiring undergrounding utilities, having space for every um, vendor, um, as well as providing parking spaces. And so Woodard requested a special use permit in order to have luxury units that could subsidize the cost of doing that. The city granted him the special use permit he requested, but only 37 of the 97 units had any interest expressed in them, so it became financially unfeasible and failed. So now we are where we are. For better or worse, the project has failed, and we have to continue moving forward and figure out what we're going to do with that space. As for a space for the city market, um, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, right now, it's continuing to be at that um, space where the parking lot is. I've heard some people suggest using it's Art Park or air, uh, areas around um, Court Square Park, possibly, where you could shut down roads for the time that the market is in use. Um, I haven't talked to enough people or researched that enough to say that one of those options is the best and we absolutely should go for it. I think we do have multiple potential alternatives. And um, you know that space where the city market was going to go is now one of the few areas of city-owned land, which means it's one of the few areas of land that the city has control over and can lay out a development vision for what should happen. So I think it's actually a very exciting opportunity because we can do something really exciting with that property. Charlottesville City Market, Lloyd Snook, you're on the clock. What is the future of the Charlottesville City Market? Where should the Charlottesville City Market be um, homed in perpetuity? 90 seconds. Well, the, uh, at this point, since there is not currently any project to use that lot for any other purpose, I'm sure they're going to stay right where they are. There has been the discussion of perhaps moving it down to the Ixark Park 
I don't know. Again, that's that's private property kinds of issues that that I'm not I'm not going to try to comment on. The one thing I do want to note, by the way, in talking about the 80 million dollar project, yes, market conditions changed. One of the reasons market conditions changed was the city basically slow walked the project and spent two years in regulatory hassles until finally, yes, markets changed over two years. It was approved in 2016. Then, as Michael noted, there were, oh, you got to underground utilities. You got to do this, got to do that. And by the time we get done 2018, Keith Woodard says, hey, I've got a million dollars in the project, but I'm walking away from it because I don't want to have to deal with this stuff. So market conditions did change, but the reason is because we, we took so long. So specifically where, I don't know, it's going to stay right where it is for the, for the meantime until some better idea comes along. Close to 900 people on the stream right now as we speak, undoubtedly the most watch debate in Charlottesville, Virginia history. You just went last, you're going to go first. Now, this is going to be a tough comment and I'm going to push you guys to be straightforward on this. Straightforward on this. Um, our current mayor, Mayor Walker, made some comments in the front page of the New York Times at a Sunday edition that has gotten a lot of folks in Charlottesville and Central Virginia had their feathers ruffled. These comments, I'll paraphrase, had something along the lines of Charlottesville is an ugly to the soul type of place. Uh, I would encourage anyone to Google the New York Times story and read Mayor Walker's comments on the Sunday edition of the New York Times. Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds, the city mayor, Mayor Walker, how should she represent the city in the world's newspaper, from a micro population or from a macro population in totality? 90 seconds. Yes. That's all you're going to give? No. My point is that she has an absolute right, of course, to represent her own viewpoint. I do think it, it's a, a wise idea for the person who is the mayor to also have the macro view. Uh, but you know, I'm not, I'm not here to, to trash Nakia Walker or to say bad things about her in particular. I do think the, the overall message that she conveys, taken in, you know, taking the whole thing together, is that people experience Charlottesville very differently, and she has experienced Charlottesville very differently from the way I have. I acknowledge that. Uh, I've said all along, by the way, that I don't think council would be a good council if it was made up of five Lloyd Snooks. And I'm not trying to make up a council of five Lloyd Snooks. I'm perfectly happy to be one of five, and one of those five is going to be Nakia Walker, and one of those five is going to be Heather Hill, and we don't know who the other two might be, perhaps Michael, perhaps somebody else, who knows. But I, I think there are pl there's plenty of room for diversity in the viewpoints expressed and the viewpoints held as to whether she should, you know, should have calmed herself down or not said as many nasty things to the New York Times. I'm not going to falter on that. Okay. Uh, Michael Payne, same question to you. Our mayor, Mayor Walker, on the front page of the New York Times, I'm paraphrasing, said Charlottesville along the lines was an ugly to the soul type of place. Um, the, you, if you win this election... If you win a seat on city council, there is a chance you could be the mayor. Well, okay, there's that. there's a chance you could. If he wins, there's a chance he could be a mayor. It's appointed by the city councilors. The question here, Mayor Walker, should she represent in the world's newspaper? Should she represent the city of Charlottesville in totality, or should she be speaking on behalf of a smaller population in the city of Charlottesville? 90 seconds, Michael Payne, you're on the clock. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I don't know anybody who works harder than Nakaya, and I know that <clears throat> Nakaya is focused on doing what's best for the city, and that's what motivates her. And I think her comments speak to the fact that people experience Charlottesville very differently, like Lloyd said. And there are a lot of people whose experience of living in Charlottesville um, reflects the mayor's comments. And I think for us, I think the challenge is how do we confront these inequalities head on? I mean, for example, according to the Economic Policy Institute, Charlottesville is one of the top 50 most unequal cities in terms of regional and wealth inequality. Rich Schuyler, who puts out the Orange Dot Report, shows that 25% of our city lives below the poverty line and aren't able to afford basic necessities. African American students in our schools are four times as likely to interact with uh, the police in schools than white students. There's a huge achievement gap in our local schools. The an unemployment rate for African-American citizens is double what it is for every other demographic. 
Over the past 10 years, average income has increased for every demographic in Charlottesville except our African American residents where average income has gone down. These are real inequalities rooted in a long history of public policies throughout the 20th century designed to exclude our African American residents from having access to housing, quality education, and wealth building opportunities. And as a community, we have to confront those inequalities and figure out how to address them. And if we don't, that perspective is always going to have some legitimacy. We have over a thousand people on the stream right now in every single media outlet in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm literally watching them as we speak, watching this stream. Maggie Thornton on Michael Payne's City Council um, Facebook page has a question. A number of questions coming in from this channel. Maggie Thornton, who is a Twitter rock star, has this question. Um, what legislative priorities do you all have for the city that you would like to see our next delegate not just carry, but also rally other General Assembly members and the governor to support. How would you work with that person to make these changes? Interestingly, the question very timely with the retirement of David Toscano. 90 seconds, Michael Payne, you're on the clock. I think the top priority would be using our platform on city council and as a city government to advocate for either loosening up or eliminating the Dillon rule. Other states have done this, including Iowa, which was the state where the Dillon rule was founded. They got rid of it through their state legislature, and actually on, on the anniversary of when they eliminated the Dillon Rule, there's celebrations in cities throughout the state because it was such a positive thing. Um, it can be done. The Dillon Rule, I think, is the biggest barrier to progress in Charlottesville. It prevents us from implementing a citywide minimum wage, removing racist Confederate statues, implementing inclusionary zoning, and all kind of other things. So I think that should be a top priority. I think... Um, advocating that the General Assembly provide a state level funding source for uh, our regional public, for a regional public transit authority would be huge because that would allow us to really have a strong public transportation system. I think in the absence of state government not eliminating or loosening up the Dillon rule, um, continuing to advocate for state government to allow us to remove our Confederate statues, to implement um, sensible gun control. Um, and the other thing is, we can advocate for these things in our legislative packet, but as long as Republicans control the General Assembly, it's not going to happen. So I think, you know, I would use my platform on city council to campaign with general people campaigning for the uh, House of Delegates and state Senate throughout this region and really highlight the importance of how what state delegates do directly impacts what we can do in city council. Okay, um, your chance. I'm going to get the question out again, and then your perspective. Maggie Thornton on Michael Payne's uh, Facebook city council page. What is up? Oh, hold on one second. She's asking another. There's so many questions coming in right now. What legislative priorities do you all have for the city that you would like to see our next delegate not just carry, but also rally other General Assembly members and the governor to support? How would you work with that person to make these changes? The question very timely, Lloyd Snook, with the... Uh, with with David Toscano's departure. Um, your thoughts, Lloyd Snook, 90 seconds, you're on the clock. Well, there are a couple of things that strike me as being things that, that sh there shouldn't, well, the, the first thing there shouldn't be any real question about is at the very least, we need to edit and amend our city charter. Uh, the city charter still has sexist or, or not, not fully inclusive language in it. It still has, uh, has, still has us electing people in May, for example, and not in November. That's something that ought to be easy to fix. This council, because again, getting back to my overall theme of council not having its act together, they didn't start talking about it until November. That's too late. That discussion needs to be in June or July or August and get the legislative package figured out. That's number one, is let's get the charter amended to reflect current reality. Number two, let's talk about uh, uh, allowing for local option on Confederate statues and things like that, uh, gun control, or at least to, to have the ability to limit guns in um, uh, emergency situations, in protest demonstrations and so on. Uh, I'm not even talking about general gun control. Let's just be able to say, if you're going to have a demonstration in our park, don't bring your gun. 
That ought to be an easy thing, but it, it's not going to get anywhere at the moment. It can't even get out of the committee. It gets referred to the committee that exists for one sole purpose, and that's to kill any legislation dealing with guns. Uh, as far as the Dillon rule goes, we're not going to solve that in the next four years. All right, all right. Keith Smith just texted me, I love the show and my haircut. Well, thank you, Keith Smith. <laughs> I love you as well. You can text me as well if you have questions. I asked a question from your um, Facebook page, now a question from your Facebook page. And you go first. We have so many questions coming. Are you gentlemen okay on time? Mm-hmm. So okay. far, okay. I don't well, you, remember when my next point is. Over, but. You have over 1,100 people watching. Scott Smith says, um, this is a question, it's a longer one, okay? Scott Smith, we have a profusion, I think he means a uh, proliferation. We have a proliferation of mixed-use development um, that's coming into very low concentration development downtown. Um, this has many benefits, but the consequences um, of this are a negative impact on our infrastructure, especially traffic and parking. Um, how can city council address the proliferation of mixed-use developments downtown and how it could impact negatively um, things like traffic and parking? Lloyd Snook, you have 90 seconds. Well, mixed-use actually was a conscious policy decision but that the city undertook about 20 or 30 years ago to decide that we want to have retail and I mean, retail on the ground floor and residential above. And part of the issue was, particularly on the downtown mall, we didn't want the downtown mall to be dead starting at 6 o'clock. And that's effectively what it was in the 70s, and that's part of why we wound up with the changes that we wound up in the pedestrian mall and so on. So we have made a conscious decision in favor of mixed use kind of use and development uh, and applied that more, more broadly. I think it is more broadly a pretty good idea, uh, but certainly council has the power, if it wants to, to change the zoning ordinance to remove the incentives uh, to make it harder if you don't like it. I personally like it as a general proposition to have uh, mixed use. Yes, there are some difficulties associated with it and different parking requirements for different kinds of, of uses to be placed in the same building is just one of those problems. But I, on balance, I think it's a good idea. Okay, Michael Payne, 90 seconds on the clock. Starting now, sir. I do just want to quickly address, you know, the Dillon rule will not be removed immediately, but if we're afraid to lay out demands, it truly will never happen. You know, I read about the history of Charlottesville's public defender's office. People said it was impossible. The first time it came up, it failed, but eventually it happened. If we're afraid to lay out our ultimate goal, it truly will never happen. But I want to say as well, you know, generally I do support mixed-use development. I do think it's a positive thing in the downtown area, but the lack of our infrastructure kept keeping up with increased density is a big problem. And I think it's something that we have to address if we're going to, as I think we should, explore significantly reducing single family zoning, allowing more by right development of duplexes and triplexes. That means that we also have to have a robust public transit system. That means we also need to encourage a less car-centric city by do, uh, investing in um, networks of pedestrian and bike trails. I think public transit is a huge one on that because without that, you're gonna see huge traffic congestion and you're, you're gonna have to build you know, more parking garages and other things that we know aren't good development moving away from a car-centric city. I also think the schools play a big part in this too. As we increase in density, if we, if we reduce single family zoning, that means more population, that means more students in our schools, and that means we need to be willing to do what's necessary to invest in the school modernization and expansion. Otherwise, we're gonna have schools overcrowding and not giving our teachers the resources they need to be as effective as they can be. Okay, gentlemen, I've done a very good job of respecting time limits here, and I appreciate that from both of you. Um, I'm literally sending text messages, monitoring a time, reading this, and checking seven Facebook <laughs> It's at the same time. Um, Lord, you went last, so you go first this time. Let's give some props to you guys first. James Watson says, uh, Michael Payne is the future. The guy is speaking the truth. Tim Ryan says, Lloyd Snook's perspective is needed. He may be the grown-up in the room. A number of uh, folks coming in and offering our perspective on our counselors, our council candidates, I should say. Uh, this is a good question here. This is a good question. Um, this is a tough question. Your views on statue removals in the city of Charlottesville, it's a question that has to be asked. If I'm not asking this question, I would not be doing my job. Um, should the statues in the city of Charlottesville, what should we do with them? Michael Payne, you have 90 seconds. I think they should absolutely be removed. I think especially after the events of uh, the summer of 2017, you know, for myself, I find it personally insulting 
um, to walk by them. And I know there's other community members who feel that much, much more severely than I do. And I also think at this point they're a security risk. As long as they're up there, we risk these far-right extremist groups coming back. Um, I think our problem is that the city did not act swiftly enough, which gave time for um, legal cases against removal to move for the courts. And we're at a point now where because of the Dillon rule, um, counselors are being held individually legally liable for their vote to remove them. So I think they absolutely need to be removed and we need to be advocating for the General Assembly to allow for their removal under the Dillon rule. And again, as long as Republicans control the General Assembly, as Lloyd said, they're never gonna let it out of committee, which is why it's so important for all of us to get involved in House of Delegates and State Senate campaigns. Every single State Senate and House of Delegates seat is up in 2019. Republicans control each chamber by one person. We can flip it, and if we flip it, I believe we will be able to remove those Confederate statues, and I want to use my platform as a candidate, and if city council, as a city councilor, to campaign with House of Delegates candidates throughout the state to highlight how important it is for Charlottesville locally to uh, flip the General Assembly. 90 seconds, under the radar, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming in under the time limit. We're gonna throw it to Lloyd Snook, over 1,300 people watching right now. Lloyd Snook, um, should the statues in the city of Charlottesville be removed, yes or no, your take on that? Yes, and the reason I would say that, whatever you may have thought about this issue in 2016, by August 13th, 2017, things had changed. There can be no question that the statues are the reason that the right came, including people from Washington State and North Dakota and Ohio and places that I didn't know had Confederate interests. Uh, came because it was a magnet, and the, the statues were a magnet, and the issue was a magnet. Uh, and, and now, not only did we have the chaos in the streets, but we had Heather Heyer killed on 4th Street, as well as the two police officers in the helicopter. Things have changed, and I will say to my friends uh, who are more conservative than I generally, but who have said that they would be willing to support me, I would say to you, I'm sorry, things have changed. And whatever you may have thought before, it's different now. I would also note, by the way, that if city council had moved more quickly, as Michael suggested, they would still be exposed to individual liability. In fact, it would be even more egregiously so because they would have moved so precipitously at a time when uh, it was admittedly up in the air. A judge would be really kind of ticked off, I think. So, that wouldn't have solved the problem. You might have removed the statues by everybody moving much faster, but you'd still have the individual liability. You might even be forced to put them back at perhaps a million dollars expense. So that wouldn't have helped. Okay, both are in right now. Uh, JW, both our council candidates are out of fluids. This is what I would ask of you gentlemen. If you could leave the glasses right here on the top of the set, this gentleman will come in and fill your cups up. I appreciate you, JW. This guy, literally one of the brains of the operation, and sometimes it comes down to this as well. Hey, Judah, don't forget uh, Lloyd Snooks. You could come in here, it's all right. It's live at its finest. This is what it comes down to. Thank you. Um, he, thank you, yes, thank you very much. You went last, so you go first on this one. Guys, I will get to as many questions as possible. This is absolutely in fuego. We are posting obscene numbers right now. Lloyd Snook, you're going to start here. Um, wow, this is a tough question. This is one of uh, the questions that came from Matthew Gilligan on Twitter. Matthew Gilligan, who you know, who you've yep. gotten to know, who you <clears throat> follow on Twitter and know as well. Um, I respect this guy quite a bit. He pushes the pace and tempo in the Twitter sphere. Um, Lloyd Snook, we start with you. Um, please put into perspective your current um, uh, respective housing experience. How will these experiences in your current respective housing shape your decision on council? 90 seconds for Lloyd Snook, please start. If I understand the question, uh, it would be responsive to say, I live in Greenbrier, it's a single family neighborhood. I have lived in semi-detached, I think was the language, uh, housing on Amherst Street, and I've lived in apartments, and I've lived in student housing, and I've lived in trailer parks, and so on. Uh, wide variety of experiences. The, uh, Matthew and I have talked a, a lot about uh, the specific question of whether we should be changing the, the zoning uh, and the definition of single family in such a way as to permit more uh, auxiliary apartments or you know, we, we con considered this in the 1980s, uh, and it was described at the time as mother-in-law apartments. 
the idea being that you, if you have a small apartment there, you can have more uh, basement apartments, whatever, for people who, uh, you know, and, and that, that sort of allows for a, potentially thousands of additional units with no difference in the way things appear from the street. So it doesn't change the overall character of the neighborhood, but it may allow students, it may allow uh, single, you know, single people to, to have a place to live, and that would work a whole lot better. Uh, so that's, I guess that's an answer. I'm not quite sure where else do we go with that. That's an answer. We're going to throw it to Michael Payne. I'm going to wait a couple seconds so you can run his uh, <laughs> beverage on set, please. Um, I appreciate that, Judah Wickhauer. Um, one of the fantastic producers of our show. So Michael Payne, the question from Twitter and Matthew Gilligan, please put into perspective your current um, housing experience. Basically he's asking where, kind of the conditions where you live now. How will these experiences shape your decision making mm -hmm. if you make it on council? 90 seconds, Michael mm -hmm. Payne. Well, part of my experience comes from working with Habitat for Humanity Virginia on statewide affordable housing issues, being a community organizer with the Charlottesville Low Income Housing Coalition. As for my personal housing experience, it comes from I live in Belmont in a basement apartment in ADU. I spend 40 to 50 percent of my income on rent, um, and un, you know, remain unsure long term whether I'll be able to afford to live in the city, and that definitely influences my approach to affordable housing and the urgency of it. Um, I think a big part of it is reforming our zoning, which is outdated and broken, and rooted in zoning, which was intentionally meant to segregate the city and remove low-income and minority residents from housing, having access to home ownership. Um, and what that means is allowing more buy-right development of duplexes and triplexes, significantly reducing single-family zoning, exploring eliminating it, which Minneapolis just did. Um, because if we allow more density in that way, we can create more affordable units, allow more people to live in more neighborhoods, reduce income and racial segregation in our housing um, without disrupting neighborhood character. But I would also say my experience with Habitat and Low Income Housing Coalition is that while I absolutely support and we must do zoning reform, that still will not provide housing for our citizens most in need. Are, are homeless and those at zero to 30 percent of area, me, area mean income, families making minimum wage, perhaps living on social security or disability income, families with perhaps no income. The only way to do that is through subsidized housing, through investing in public housing through a bond, and investing in Section 8, ho Section 8 housing vouchers and the redevelopment of Friendship Court. That's the only way we're going to be able to provide housing for those at zero to 30 percent of area mean income. Um, next question. You guys are killing it. You're killing it, killing it, killing it. This question is um, from Michael's Facebook page. If you have a question, comment, concern, relay it to the council candidates on any of the seven channels you're watching across the um, I Love Seaville network. This question is coming from, and I'm scrolling up because there's a lot of questions on your page, Bradford Carl Slocum. Bradford Carl Slocum. Could either candidate, ask particularly Mr. Snook, Please elaborate on how a greater police presence on the downtown mall would lead to a more welcoming environment for minorities. As a younger white male, 2017 completely shattered my trust in policemen, so I can barely imagine how our black residents and other races feel if they see more police presence on the downtown mall. You went last, so you go first this time. 90 seconds on the clock. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's an important point that for a lot of residents, increased police presence on the downtown mall would make the, uh, the, the downtown mall feel even less welcoming and inclusive for them, which I think, again, gets back to the breakdown of trust between the local community and our police department, which I think we have to acknowledge is grounded in some legitimate concerns, both about the policing in 2017 and a longer history of discriminatory policing practices in terms of discriminatory use of stop and frisk, um, disproportionate contact with the police and city schools from our African-American students and other issues like that. So I think it's an important point, um, and I think, you know, it's an important to take a community uh, policing um, approach to any kind of um, uh, proposal like that and to get full feedback from um, every corner of our community, and I think if we have a robust civilian police review board, that could perhaps be a mechanism for getting impact on how all Charlottesville's residents would view increasing police presence on the downtown mall or anywhere else. Uh, Lloyd Snook, the question, um, 
We have a number of questions coming in. I'm going to do my best to get to all these. But at the same time, these gentlemen also have day-to-day -day responsibilities they have to get to. So I'm going to cherry pick roughly four to five more questions as we wind down this interview. Um, Bradford Carl Slocum, in a lot of ways, this was addressed to you. Um, he said, could either candidate, particularly Mr. Snook, please elaborate on how a greater police presence on the downtown mall would lead to a more welcoming environment for minorities? As a young white male, 2017 completely shattered my trust in police officers, so I can barely imagine how our black residents and other races feel. Lloyd Snook, you have 90 seconds, sir. It comes down to who the officer is or officers are. 20 years ago, Cornelia Johnson, was, later sheriff, uh, was the person, particularly during the day, who spent the day walking up and down the mall as a city police officer. She engaged with everybody, she smiled with everybody, she talked with everybody, but she would arrest you if there was a need to. She was black, of course. Uh, people felt welcome when she was around. Uh, other people, and we had, at one point we had uh, some ambassadors, I think was the title, Ida Lewis was another one of those ambassadors. Uh, who, who would make it a welcoming presence. I remember about 20 years ago, probably, maybe 15 years ago, we had a complaint, we being the, the criminal defense bar, about a particular officer who was on the downtown mall who was being particularly difficult to deal with for African Americans. And we went to Tim Longo. And, w and when we said, to t we described the problem to Tim Longo, and Tim Longo investigated it, and Tim moved that guy off of the mall. That was leadership. We haven't had that leadership recently. Uh, I think to, uh, if we could get that kind of leadership and get the right people on the mall, absolutely police presence can be both welcoming to the African-American community and safe for the rest of us. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I'll but you do about five more questions here, then I'll give each of you guys um, a couple minutes to close any way you want. Uh, we will take the video, um, especially the closing, and produce it for you and email it to you so you guys can leverage that in any campaign capacity you would like. This question is coming from my LinkedIn page, and a uh, very noteworthy and successful um, real estate agent and Valerie Ford, Valerie Easter. Um, Valerie asked the question about Airbnbs. Um, you went last, so you go first this time. Um, this question basically is tied to the regulation of Airbnbs in the city of Charlottesville. City of Charlottesville is doing a lot to regulate um, Airbnbs and basically what property owners, homeowners can do with their properties from generating revenue. Her question, um, which I think is a good one. Um, Lloyd Snook, are you satisfied, and Michael Payne as well, are you satisfied with the current Airbnb short-term rental changes made and what was discussed during the February 12th work session, or do you think they are way too restrictive? Lloyd Snook, I'm calling up the stopwatch, and I'm giving you 90 seconds starting now. I don't know exactly what was discussed at the February 12th work session, so my answer to this will be necessarily vague. Uh, I, I'm aware of two things. First of all, that I've talked to some people who have been trying to get ADUs, uh, um, accessory dwelling units approved, or auxiliary dwelling units approved, and have not been able to do so because of issues they've been having with the uh, Neighborhood Development Services staff. This also just tangentially gets to another point that was raised on Saturday, which is the efficiency study for the Neighborhood Development Services staff shows about 20 or 30 different things that the consultants said, these are really screwed up in this department, fix them. So we've got a, the, the place that is dealing with the ADU problem is not doing a good job. And I would say one thing we can absolutely do is to get the Neighborhood Development Services Department doing a better job on the regulations that we've got. Again, I can't comment specifically on the, the things that were suggested at the work session, recognize that a work session doesn't mean anything is law, so we don't yet have to, to know all of the details there. But uh, I, w w there are lots of things we can do to make that process easier. Michael Payne, the same question to you. I'll read it again from Valerie Easter on my LinkedIn page. Are you satisfied with the current Airbnb short-term rental changes made and what was discussed during the February 12th work session, or do you think they are way too restrictive? Mm -hmm. Well, from likewise, I was not at that work session, but I was at meetings where um, the city had actually conducted a study on its ADU policies and they consulted um, with people from Seattle and other cities that have reformed their ADU process. And what they found is that the city's ADU process, both from a statewide and national perspective, 
is actually not that bad. It's actually fairly streamlined compared to a lot of other localities, and there's not too much that could be done with it to allow for more ADUs. So we've sort of squeezed out um, a lot of what we can from the ADU process. Is there more that can be done? I'm sure there is. Um, particularly, I think there's things we could do to incentivize ADUs to go to um, either permanent rentals or try to incentivize them to go to more lower income residents because a lot of cities around the country have run into a problem where the ADU process results in the creation of Airbnbs, which, end up, which can end up actually accelerating an affordable housing crisis because you have units that could be used for permanent rentals for, for residents end up only going to people who are coming in for a football game or for tourism. And I think we need to make sure we, we balance that approach to make sure that we're not restricting our housing stock even more and taking away potential tax revenue that could be going you know, to, to hotels and other lodging. Two more questions, and then we give you a chance to close. Got two? Got two? All right, this one's um, a question that's recently making the rounds on the news, and uh, I think the question that uh, I think we need to talk about. This is about the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial. Um, and the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial being non-accessible. I'm going to read a post. It was passed to me by Jay Wyant, um, and Jim Carpenter has put this on the radar. Um, he says, I am offended that the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial is so non-accessible. I am offended knowing there's currently only one way to get the memorial, which is a quarter-mile walk, which takes 13 minutes. I am offended when obeying the lights, having to go across seven lanes of traffic and just being missed by a car blowing the light. I am offended having to watch Jim Schistler, and I apologize if I messed your last name up, yeah. but Jim Schistler at 86 years old, making his way up a hill with his cane. All folks with a handicap should be able to park closer to the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial. Jim is one of the three originators of the memorial over 50 years ago. I'm offended knowing there are 90-year-old moms, one of the Charlottesville Admiral casualties, who cannot get to the memorial because it is too dangerous. Um, he continues, and I encourage people to go to Jim Carpenter's Facebook page and read his analysis on the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial. Um, Michael Payne, it's your, your turn to go first, 90 seconds on the clock. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this highlights a huge issue that too often gets ignored, and that is the issue of disability rights. And I think um, it does play into the issue of public transportation and investment in our infrastructure in terms of pedestrian and bike trails because we have a lot of streets that are very outdated that either have no pedestrian uh, uh, trails or if they do they're very unsafe and not very accessible for people who are elderly or disabled um, and I think that's why those investments are so important. Um, as for accessibility specifically with the Dogwood Memorial. Um, honestly, it's an issue that I am not too familiar with. I'm not sure what specific changes could be made to make it more accessible just because um, I am not haven't researched that issue much, but I would certainly support both looking at that specifically and also looking throughout the city. Um, how can we invest in our pedestrian trails to make them more accessible and safe for um, elderly and disabled residents? Okay, Lloyd Snook, you have 90 seconds on the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial. Jim Carpenter has put this in the spotlight. It is now in the news cycle. It's something that I think undoubtedly needs to be discussed. 90 seconds, Lloyd Snook. Jim has four specific suggestions. I talked to him today. He's got four specific suggestions about uh, ways that the problem might be remedied, and a lot of it comes down to uh, the fact that nobody thought about this problem when they built the limited access James, uh, John Warner Parkway, when of course we've got limited access off of 250, you can't just go put in a new driveway any place you want to put in a new driveway. Uh, when they then put in the, uh, the skate park at the top of, Ma of McIntyre Park there, they've provided for parking for people who want to access McIntyre, uh, the, the skate park on the other side of the railroad tracks and you've got to walk across the bridge that's about, I guess it's about to be finished, hasn't been finished yet, uh, to get there. That's very, very difficult. That's probably just as far, if not farther, uh, for somebody who wants to get to the Vietnam Memorial. What's particularly distressing about it, Jim told me, was that he's been trying for more than four years, ever since the Warner Parkway went through, he's been trying for four years to get somebody in the city hall to take him and his concerns seriously. 
That's the real problem, it seems to me. There are plenty of solutions, and Jim's got four suggestions. But if we can't get anybody to talk to him about it, that's a situation a city council should be getting involved with. I follow the Vietnam, the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial folks. Follow it closely. Check out Jim Carpenter's post, please. I think it's, um, I, th I think it resonates, especially for folks that certainly tied to, uh, tied to the memorial. Um, we're going to wind down here. He went last, so he goes first. This time I have roughly three questions left. I think both council candidates have been honest, straightforward, um, eloquent, um, approachable. Um, and I appreciate their time. We've been here 94, we've been here 94 minutes. You gentlemen are kicking some ass and taking names. Um, I'm gonna throw this to Lloyd. Um, this is something that is in the news often. We've touched on this briefly. 55% of the city of Charlottesville is zoned R1. Um, the city of Charlottesville is 10.27 miles in, um, not land mass, what do I call it? 10.27 miles in totality? Square, area. An, an area? Square miles. Ten point, in square miles, 10.27 miles. We are landlocked. There's nowhere to go. And 55% 50, <clears throat> roughly of the city is zoned R1, which limits what can be done. This is an open-ended question. 55% zone um, R1, 10.27 miles landlocked, nowhere else to go. go. Lloyd Snook, Thoughts on this from an open-ended question, the same will go to you. I know both of you, this hits close to home, 90 seconds. Well, the first thing I would say, you know, the city has been, has had a large R1 area for a long time, but in 1991, there was a zoning change that was put through that greatly increased the number of lots that were going to be deemed to be single family. This was an idea that had, I think, a very good original concept. I say that because it was my idea originally, but it got distorted. The original concept was let's protect the areas right around the university and the university hospital, areas that were zoned R2 because they, didn't, they weren't large enough, didn't have large enough lot sizes to be R1, so they had to be R2, which meant students were coming in and buying them up and pushing out the black families that lived there. Somebody in 1990-91, after I got off the Planning Commission, said, let's extend that citywide. Now we're doing it in Belmont and all kinds of other places that don't have the same uh, problems uh, or have different kinds of problems. So it, it was a, perhaps a good idea that went way wrong in 1991. If we were to say, let's have more basement apartments, for example, it would make it easier to undo some of that damage. That's probably the easiest fix right now. We don't have a lot of new room. We don't have a lot of new lots that are ready to, to start building where we'll put smaller houses on smaller lots. So the only way we're going to get at it quickly is to allow more basement apartments. Uh, Michael Payne, you have 90 seconds starting now, sir. Well, I think our zoning uh, has a long and ugly history, and it's one of the biggest problems facing the city. Again, 55% of the city zoned R1, while over 60% of city residents or renters, um, increasing housing costs, and it's rooted in a history of segregation. If you look at an overlay of where down zoning happened, it almost perfectly overlays where neighborhoods where there were racial covenants. And if you look at um, discussions throughout the 20th century, duplexes and triplexes were associated with non right residents. And that's a major part of the reason single family zoning was pushed through and duplex is not allowed because people associated single family homing, homes with wealthy white residents. And right now we're in a worst case situation where wealthy white neighborhoods, which again overlay pretty closely with where there were uh, racial covenants in the 19th and 20th century, have all single family zoning, no blue duplexes, no apartments, and so we're pushing all our density into low income and particularly low income African American communities. And in affordable housing, we say who bears the burden of density? And in Charlottesville, because it's been politically convenient, we've pushed all of it into low-income African-American communities, which has produced dynamics like the creation of the flats, which again, accelerates gentrification because if you're building an expensive, dense development in a low-income area, it reduces rents regionally, but it increases dense rents in that neighborhood. So what we need to do is to spread that burden throughout the city by reducing or eliminating single family zoning and allowing by right development of duplexes, triplexes, and more apartments in everywhere in the city. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna give both council candidates, uh, we'll say 90 seconds of their own time to go anywhere they want. Um, before I do that, a lot of folks on the, the stream here. Keith Smith, Jerry, as you know, it took nearly two years of hard work by the TJ, 
Bay uh, PDC to create the Regional Housing Partnership. As the chairman of this partnership, please let all your viewers know that the meetings are open to the public. The Regional Housing Summit um, will have this, the Regional Housing Summit will be at the Omni Charlottesville Hotel April 19th, 2019. We have a team attending from Portland who will speak to ADUs. Planning Commissioner Rory Stolzenberg watching now says there's an ongoing ADU review in conjunction with the Portland State University. And then both gentlemen said, ah, we said the same thing at the same time, which is the beautiful thing about the internet. I see you, Olivia. This is going well, don't you think? Yeah, I think it's going well, too. Um, OK, you went last, so you go first on this one. My last question, and then you guys have any time to go anywhere you want. Um, I would like for you gentlemen, because I think your professional um, careers have a lot of foundation, positive foundation, of why you are strong candidates um, for city council. So here's the question I have for you, and same one for you. 90 seconds. Please put into perspective your current professional career and how this career path will shape your decision making on council. You have 90 seconds, Michael Payne, starting now. Mm -hmm. Well, again, you know, working in affordable housing with Habitat for Humanity Virginia gives me a lot of expertise in housing issues and also makes it for me a top priority. And particularly at a moment where experiencing affordable the affordable housing crisis, I think that is an important perspective to have on council. And I'd also say, I, you know, I view, I think I have some value to bring in my experience as a community organizer both with the Charlottesville Income Housing Coalition, co-founding Indivisible Charlottesville, because I think the problem we have in the city is everyone can agree that city government has not been functioning very well. The question is, what is the root cause of that? I would argue the root cause of that is the breakdown of trust between local government and the community. And in order to rebuild that trust, it's not enough to have good ideas. It's not enough to have a top-down approach. We have to reach out to everyone in the community for any policies, ideas we have, receive feedback, get input both to change our policy ideas and hear, hear other perspectives and build trust. Because if we're not doing that, it doesn't matter if we have the best ideas in the world. We're not gonna be able to unify around those solutions and make change. And it's important for us to recognize that, again, there are deep historical and legitimate reasons for that breakdown of trust. And I don't think I alone have the answers, but I think my experience as a community org organizer can help work across difference and uplift the work being done by all kind of community groups already, like the Food Justice Network, immigrant rights organizations, affordable housing organizations you know, across the board. Okay, Michael Payne, I appreciate that. Lloyd Snook, the same question to you. Please put into perspective your current professional career and how this career path will shape your decision making on Charlottesville City Council. 90 seconds, Lloyd. Okay, I've been a criminal defense lawyer for 39 years. Uh, during that time, I've also done a lot of other things in the law. I have, for example, uh, incorporated nonprofits. I in did the incorporation papers for the Greater Charlottesville Habitat for Humanity. I did the, Charles the papers for the Virginia Coalition on Jails and Prisons, also the Central Virginia Parrothead Club, if you're a Jimmy Buffett fan. Uh, I've represented MACA. I've represented Offender Aid and uh, Restoration. Uh, I've served eight years on the Planning Commission. The three issues that are most important to me, I've got experience dealing with all of them. First of all, the government not working well. I was in city government 1981, 1989. I saw it when it was working well. I saw it when the Planning Commission made decisions on time. I saw it when people could actually get stuff done, when there was a city manager who actually knew, you know, was actually in charge of the city government. So that experience helps. As far as my second prong, that we need to be a thinking like a 21st century city, not a 20th century town. The affordable housing issue, gentrification issues, these are issues that I've been dealing with through the Piedmont Housing Alliance, uh, through the weatherization program uh, that I was on the board and president of the board of back in the 1980s. These are things I know about. Finally, the pipeline to prison is the third issue that I think is really important. After 39 years as a criminal defense lawyer, I've seen what happens to our mistakes. We need to work as a community to fix them. Okay, um, we're gonna close by giving each candidate a chance 
say roughly 90 seconds to go anywhere they want, cover anything that hasn't been discussed. Um, Harris Tolber, this is a, certainly a sizzle reel waiting to happen. Every single one, I mean, I think you're gonna be working overtime to create these sizzle reels, my friend. Pat Owen on your Facebook page says, where can this be watched later? You can go to ilovesevil.com where the interview, or excuse me, the live debate will be archived in perpetuity. The live format has value without question. You can see questions coming in from the viewership, but the true value of this program is the evergreen nature of the show, the fact that it lives in perpetuity on the interwebs, if you may. Um, so, 90 seconds. You went last, so you go first on this one. Lloyd Snook, the show is yours. I just finished talking about uh, issues that I'd been involved with and the organizations that I'd been involved with, but the, the thing that I want people most to understand, I think, is that I don't stay up late at night writing position papers against the death penalty. I was staying up late at night during those times working for individuals, working for Michael Smith or Willie Turner, whose case I got reversed in the U.S. Supreme Court, or Joe Geritano, who was actually there on Saturday with us. Uh, it's the people that, that drive me. It's, I am, our law firm motto is lawyers helping people who need help. That's why I do what I do, and that's the spirit that I want to bring to city council. Related to that, I wanted to point out something that happened. It was very interesting. On August 12, 2018, we had the one-year anniversary and it was based of the August 12th incidents, and it was basically celebrated by two very different groups. One group was doing a march from Washington Park down to the downtown mall. Another group gathered later on in the day over at uh, Alvin Edwards Church, the Mount Zion First African Baptist Church, and I was struck by the fact, as I was in both places that day, that there was almost nobody who was in both places, that they, were, they experienced things very differently, and they are in some ways kind of excluding the other from their experience of August 12th. They are in a sense calling each other out. I want us to call each other in. Okay, Michael Payne, you are afforded the same amount of time, 90 seconds to go in any direction you want. The clock has started now, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I think as a community, we face significant challenges in terms of our affordable housing crisis, a history of racial inequity, our economic inequality. And as we become a regional metropolitan area, we're sort of at a crossroads. We can take action now to become a statewide model for how communities can grow in an equitable way that unifies communities around solutions to affordable housing, that promotes racial and economic equity, and after everything we've been through after, over the past two years, I ran out of a conviction that we cannot continue the way we have been, but we also cannot go back to the way things were. For decades, this community has had for pervasive inequalities. Currently, 25% of our residents live below the poverty line. Our public housing remains in conditions of unacceptable repair. But throughout the community, we have incredible talent and incredible commitment. We have groups working on immigrants' rights, on affordable housing, on food justice, all kind of issues. And I think as council, we can uplift that work, not just by making legislative changes, but taking a community organizing approach and working with these groups throughout the community and come up with a way where we can build community wealth work with our nonprofit sector to promote equity and do something unprecedented. And I think after all we've been through as a community, that's what we need. We need to have this result in positive, transformative change. Everything we've been through can't just result in going back to the way things were. Okay, both gentlemen have done extremely well today. Um, June 11th primary, and Harris Tolber, I always close by letting him, because I like to challenge him to get him out of his comfort zone, our director, what you learned from today. I'll get to that in a matter of moments, Harris, um, so you have a time to collect your thoughts, so I'm not putting you on your spot. June 11th primary, ladies and gentlemen, is gonna determine, um, is gonna determine this, so I encourage everyone to get involved. The whole, whole premise and the whole concept of this platform is to put Charlottesville, Virginia in a positive spotlight, and one of the things that I'm doing is I'm using this platform to introduce you to, I would say, two of the front runners um, for, uh, for, for council. I'm welcoming Don Gathers while he is not in the race. If Don Gathers chooses to get back into the race, he's, I think, undoubtedly one of the front runners as well. In fact, Don Gathers is gonna join me this Thursday at 12.30 on the I Love Seville show. The whole point is if there's more education in the ecosystem, you're more informed to make a better decision. 
And I think we're at a crossroads in Charlottesville, post A12, from a regional national stigma. Um, we have a lot of skin in the game. And whether you're a small business owner, whether you're an activist, whether you're working at a nonprofit, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're old, young, whether you're middle age, Charlottesville's at a crossroads. I encourage you, perhaps I implore you, to spend more of your time, and our time is our most precious commodity, spend more of your time to get involved civically, to get involved with what's going on from a local standpoint. Because when you're more involved, you're more informed. When you're more informed, you're more apt to follow perhaps the right council candidate and vote better. That's all I'm trying to do here. Positive spotlight on Charlottesville, Virginia. Harris Tolber, uh, we're gonna put the spotlight on you, sir. You're the director. What did you learn today on the I Love Seville show? Um, Jerry, it's clear that both of the candidates on our show today deeply care about their fellow community members. Um, I think it's also important um, to remember that we don't all, as community members, um, have one collective thought. I had, a, I had an intense debate with one of my closest friends the other day about a deep ideological worldview, um, and we both agreed that we had a difference of opinion. And I think that it's important as we move forward as a community to realize that that's healthy and that, you know, if we, if we all had one collective thought, we wouldn't be human. And I think the important thing is, as, as these two candidates so clearly do, to respect each other, respect each other's opinion, opinions, and also remember that we all come from different family and cultural backgrounds that are going to give us a difference of opinion. And that's healthy in any community and in any personal relationship. Um, I think we had a great show today, Jerry, and um, hopefully we can continue it going forward. As you say every day, um, it's important to love each other and, and as individuals in our community. Thanks. Well said. Well said. Harris Tolbert, thank you very much. I agree. We can agree to disagree with people, and we can still coexist in a community. If we disagree with somebody, who cares? That's what makes our community awesome. It's just a matter of doing it respectfully. My name is Jerry Miller for Harris Tolbert, for Judah Wickhauer, for Lauren Linsky. I close the show the same way. Guys, Give more than you take, and please live life by the golden rule, because if you do, Charlottesville, Virginia will be a better place. It's the I Love Seville Show. I'm Jerry Miller. I will see you tomorrow at 1230 on the I Love Seville Network. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Work. Good Thank work. Uh, next thing is the photo for the package, and we will send you guys the sizzle reels. Everything go well? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Thank you. Thank you for putting this together. Yeah, I think we were on max capacity 1,400 um, on the street. Um, well done. Well done, gentlemen. Harris, you get the uh, camera ready to go when you have an opportunity. I know you have to go. I have a 2.30 dentist appointment with, Bennett, with Dr. Tate <laughs> upstairs. Thank God he's upstairs. <laughs>